It is a brand new week, and that means it's time for a brand new video here at Wise Disciple. I'm Nate Sala, and I'm helping you become the effective Christian that you were meant to be. Did you know that Jesus calls all of his disciples to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves in Matthew chapter 10, 16? What does that mean in today's kind of culture? Thanks for asking. That's a great question. That's what this channel is all about, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've got a lot of series uh, in the can on the YouTube channel trying to help you along these lines. One of them is Debate Teacher Reacts, where I look at theology and apologetics debates and react to them as a former debate teacher. And that's what I think I'm doing tonight. Um, I just got back from uh, Dallas. Uh, actually, there were a series of events that I uh, was a part of that I put on as part of Summit Ministries, which, uh, which I also work for. And uh, I'm actually directly after this tomorrow heading to Atlanta for an event at Mount Bethel Church. So if any of you happen to be within a stone's throw of Mount Bethel, um, I'll be teaching Thursday morning at the church there, First State Evangelism. So I look forward to seeing you all down there. Well, I think the video tonight is a, is it a, I think it's a pastor reacts. It, maybe it'll be both, a debate teacher and a pastor, and so I'll be bringing both backgrounds into this discussion. Today's video is a discussion between um, Sean McDowell and Matthew Vines. They're going to wrestle with um, what exactly the Bible teaches about homosexuality. Now, this is absolutely live, so if I stutter, if I make mistakes, if I go slow, we're going to capture it all. So this is actually live. I thank you all for joining me. Um, now, McDowell is going to argue for the traditional Christian position on sex in marriage, and Vines is going to argue that the Bible is inclusive when it comes to same-sex relationships. So, uh, let's go ahead and tee up, and let's see what happens. Should be interesting. Here we go. So, your first argument, which I talked about, is citing Matthew 7 that because of experience, we need to go back and reconsider scripture. Where does Jesus teach that we are to evaluate biblical teaching based on experience? Bam, okay, right out of the gate, Sean McDowell, bam, home run. That, is, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that is, what a question, right? And isn't that the $6 million question, you know? Where in the Bible do you get this idea that experience is your Bible teacher? Shouldn't the Bible be your Bible teacher? Love it. That's, that's a question that we all need to ask progressive Christians and those who are taken with the teachings of Matthew Vines. Let's see what he says. Oh, by the way, Matthew 7. Uh, so McDowell referenced this uh, right at the outset of the comments here. It's because Vines brings this up in his opening statement. So again, as I've always encouraged with stuff like this, you got to watch the whole debate. If you can, I'm going to uh, give a link to that in the notes after this live stream. Uh, Vines talks about how Jesus said that you will know false prophets by their fruit. But then he tried to suggest that this doesn't apply uh, to same-sex couples because many of same-sex couples display the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. So if they're displaying the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, well, then they're not false prophets, as Jesus explained them in Matthew 7. So, actually, <laughs> now that we're spending all this time on Matthew 7, let's just go ahead and take a real quick look at Matthew chapter 7. Uh, let's see. So, for those of you, sometimes you ask me, Nate, what program are you running? I'm running Logos, uh, which I actually really, really enjoy. Um, yeah, Matthew chapter 7, uh, let's start it at verse uh, 15 here. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. What a picture. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Um, Okay, I, I can stop there. So, just for reference, this is what uh, McDowell is talking about with vines. Well, Jesus is teaching in Matthew 7. Is specifically, he's talking about false prophets or exactly. false teachers. I just think that that principle has a natural applicability beyond that, because I've never seen a Christian teaching that destroyed people's lives that was a good okay, Christian so, teaching. Okay, so, so slow down. Right. This is not what Jesus taught. Jesus You're teaches saying, the principle. 
Jesus teaches a different principle. Jesus teaches good fruit is obedience and bad fruit is lack of obedience. That's what he said. If you're going beyond it, you're reading in a principle into Jesus that's not there in the text. Am I right? No, I just think we have to- So McDowell is getting at the context within which this teaching of Jesus sits. Look at the verse again, one more time. This is really important. Okay, we won't spend too much time on this. But again, look at this. Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Uh, you will recognize them by their fruits, right? Well, wait a second. Jesus knew his Bible, okay? He, he knew the Old Testament, was extremely familiar with it. And like a good rabbi, basically everything Jesus said either was a quotation from the Old Testament or a reference to it. And so as you read this passage, well, let me back up. As I read this passage, I think of uh, Jeremiah 23. I, I think Jeremiah 23 is one of the backdrops for uh, Jesus' words about false prophets. Look at, look at Jeremiah 23 with me real quick. Um, Jeremiah, 20, let me see. Jeremiah talks about... Um, I was just talking about this too. That's why it's fresh. Yeah, so Jeremiah 23, look at this, verse 26. Uh, let me back up. 23, I am, am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Look at verse 26. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? And who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? Who think to make my people forget my name, by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. Now, here, here's what I was thinking. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord? That sounds like, what does grapes have in common with thorn bushes? Right? So, so that takes us back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said... Very specifically, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, right? So I think Jeremiah 23 is in the background of what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7. But notice how, how do we identify false prophets? We identify them by their what? It's their false teaching, right? But how do I know that? Well, because the Lord is concerned. So again, in Jeremiah 23 that false prophets are not speaking my word faithfully, right? But by the way, we don't need Jeremiah 23 to understand this. Jesus goes on to say that one day, this is the scariest uh, uh, verse ever, you know, um, one day people will not know, like they will, they will proclaim his name, but he will not know them. Look at this. This is literally attached. The next few verses, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? So there it is again, prophecy. Uh, and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So we see people prophesying in Jesus' name, but they are actually workers of lawlessness. So then what is the fruit of a prophet, right? Primarily, it's the consequences of what they teach, right? If they, if they prophesy or teach, and the consequence of that is that the church divides or many fall away, you know, they become lawless. Because of the teaching, they're a false prophet. By the way, that's exactly what uh, happened in Acts, um, well, anyway, let's get back to the video. I'm, I'm, I'm going on and on. I have a different interpretation of it. Okay, so why is my interpretation wrong then? Why is the interpretation saying you can evaluate teachings of Jesus based on somebody's experience? Why does the text say that I'm wrong in my interpretation? Because we both said we got to look at the words of Jesus. And I don't see him saying that. Matthew 7, Matthew 3, John 10. Where does the text say that? So describe to me again, refresh me on your argument here, about, so you're saying fruit, in your understanding of the text, is only about 
obedience and has nothing to do with what Galatians 5 calls the fruit of the Spirit? Uh, we can go to Galatians 5, but it's not just me. I have a ton of commentaries I pulled off. I couldn't find one that disagreed with me, not that I read all of them. So it's not my interpretation. The standard interpretation when you look in the context is Jesus is saying, you can judge a prophet by its fruit. Good fruit is when the prophet's message causes somebody to turn and repent. Bad fruit is lawlessness. The verses after that say that. In fact, John the Baptist gives the exact same phrase in Matthew 3, verses 7 through 10, when he's saying he's speaking about repentance, and then he says, mm -hmm. a good fruit leads to repentance. Mm -hmm. That's the clear context. So why yeah. am I wrong? Yeah, McDowell is right here. John the Baptist famously excoriates the Pharisees and tells them to uh, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. You know, you snakes. It's, it's uh, very lively, John the Baptist. Um, so it's primarily about a prophet's teaching. Does Galatians 5 and the fruits of the Spirit have something to do with judging a false prophet's fruit? Maybe, but the bigger, more primary way that we identify fruit, the way that Jesus is speaking about it in Matthew 7, is determining whether a false prophet's teaching aligns with God's word and causes folks to adhere to God's commands. Because if not, they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. And you can track this line of thought all throughout the New Testament. It's brought up in Acts. Paul talks about this later in the epistles. So does the apostle Peter. On my exegesis of Matthew chapter 7, that's what I want to know, sticking strictly to the exegesis. Well, I just suppose it's a question of, does this principle have a broader applicability? And to me, that's a, it, I, I believe that it does. If you don't, that's fine. And I think there are other, you know, this is, to me, what I tried to do in the opening chapters of my book was offer what I saw as three different warrants. So, oh, oh, hold on. So McDowell says, hey, Jesus is talking about fruit, right? He's talking about f fruit is about a false prophet's teaching primarily. Then Vine says, well, it's about broader applicability. Okay, what does that mean? Does broader applicability mean that we ignore the fact that fruit entails obeying God's commands? Uh, what happens when one of those commands is that sex is only for marriage and marriage is only for one man and one woman for life? ...for a reconsideration of this topic. So I do think that the harmful, destructive impact of the church's rejection of same-sex relationships is something that should matter to us. Of course, in, I agree 100%. It's something that should matter to us in asking whether we've read the text correctly, but it's not my only warrant for a reconsideration. And so if you disagree with my interpretation of Matthew 7, I mean, that's okay, that's fair. It's fair for you to disagree about that. But I also talk about, you know, this is, this is why I kind of put forward, um, I think there are multiple warrants. And another one... Okay, so slow down. Let, let me stick to this before okay. we go on. Because it's not just about interpretation. You have to point me back to the text and say why your interpretation better explains what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7. I don't disagree in principle. If we look at the lives of LG, LGBT people, and it can be proven that it's actually the biblical teaching itself that causes that suffering, which is something I wouldn't well, I would say the interpretation. come back to that. Right. Okay, now I would agree in the interpretation. Then we should look at it. That's fine, but that's not a teaching that Scripture says. Jesus never said that anywhere in the Gospels. What he said is good fruit is repentance, bad fruit is disobedience. So it's not about somebody's experience. It's about the objective teaching whether we obey it or not. So it's not an emotional or experience, it's a moral principle. So you're welcome to bring in that principle, but don't use Matthew 7 if Matthew 7 isn't supporting the thing that you're claiming that it does. That's my only pushback. If we're gonna care about the words of Jesus, we gotta go right back to the context and see what he said. So it seems to me you have two options. Either stop using the first example in the book about Matthew and say, this is a principle that Jesus didn't say, but I think it's a good idea, or show me why my exegesis is wrong. Well, I guess I don't understand why you don't consider the fruit of the Spirit to be good fruit. Well, let's go to Galatians 5. Sure. <laughs> so here's what's really interesting about Galatians chapter 5. So maybe McDowell is going to bring this up, but w one of the things... Uh, Paul does directly 
before he talks about uh, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is he talks about the desires of the flesh, right? And it's, it's very Pauline in style to, to sort of contrast two different uh, kinds of things. Actually, let's go there. We're talking about it. Might as well just go there. And now we are doing exactly what YouTube and the founders of YouTube want. We are reading the Bible uh, on uh, YouTube. Amen? All right, uh, Galatians 5, and it's probably verse uh, 16. Actually, let me skip down. Yeah, 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife. You get a list of all these things, but notice the first one right there, sexual immorality. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, okay? So sexual immorality is key. What is sexual immorality? Great question. Paul has clearly defined that in other places in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 6, right? Romans chapter 1. It includes same-sex sexual activity. Uh, where is this? Genesis, Exodus, Galatians. <laughs> Galatians 5, verse 16, okay? So, by the way, we've moved out of Matthew. We've moved out of the Gospels. We're now into Paul. So not that it's not relevant, but in terms of exegesis, you start with the book itself, then you move to others like it, and then outside. So we've gone far on the rung of exegesis, so to speak. If you read 5.16, it says, but I, I say, walk by the Spirit, you know what, gratify the desires of the flesh. 5.16. Mm -hmm. So he's contrasting being filled with the Spirit mm -hmm. with the desires of the flesh. Skip down to verse 19, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, which is porneia, which would have been understood as a variety of sexual sins, including divorce, it would have been fornication, and it would have included homosexual behavior, impurity, sensuality, etc. That's the verse right before. Through 21, envy, drunkenness, orgies. This is verse 22, contrasting this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, etc. And then 24 comes back to it. It says, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what is Paul saying? He's saying you have a choice to live in the Spirit, or you have a choice to live in the flesh. If you are living in the flesh, which involves sexual immorality, then you are not filled with the Spirit. So sure, somebody who's not a, a, a Christian or what else can have, or a same-sex relationship, can have some of that kindness. I would never say that. I'm not saying that somebody in a same-sex relationship doesn't have kindness or goodness within them. Please don't hear me saying that for a second. But Paul is saying, if you're involved in sexual immorality, then by definition, you are not living filled by the Spirit. So even when we go outside of Matthew and we go to Galatians, it says the same thing, that fruit of the Spirit is not somebody's experience. It's tied to obedience. Mm -hmm. Just if we stick to the text. Certainly love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are all things that we do experience, right? You wouldn't know sure. joy if you didn't experience joy. So I don't think we can completely extract this from people's personal experiences, but also... So right now, let me put on my debate teacher hat for a second. McDowell is killing it. You know, the more, now, from what I understand, this is not a debate. This is supposed to be more of a discussion. But the more that I hear this exchange, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, glad it, I'm glad this is a pastor reacts, right? Uh, but in terms of asking great leading questions and controlling the discussion and even framing, McDowell is just doing a great job. He wouldn't let vines move on. He says, slow down, slow down, right? <laughs> he doesn't want to gloss over the exegesis, you know? This is how you do it. This is really great. Your point about sexual immorality is true, but it also kind of just gets back to our fundamental disagreement, because I don't think that all same-sex relationships constitute sexual immorality. I, you're right. Exactly. That's and so that's why I would be interested in understanding more about, like, do you, would you agree with me that the Bible does not talk about same-sex marriage specifically? Okay, so can I come back to that? 
Okay. Before we leave, we, we leave the text. I'm not dismissing the question. I think that I is the, the first, textual question. I think I have the first 20, and then you have the last 20. Right? Isn't that yeah, how it works? Yeah, that's fine. You Technically, that is that how it's supposed to be? Wait, who has what? 20? Well, we didn't we didn't divide it that oh, way. Oh, I thought we did. I'm sorry. Time. All right. No. Never mind. Okay. On on this text, let me just push back. Then we'll come to okay. your question. I was like, okay. you don't want to answer my question, Sean. No, I. <laughs> not too quickly. Okay. Okay. Yes, people experience love, joy, peace, and patience. I grant that. I would grant that people who are non-Christians can experience some of those things. Just because somebody has some of those characteristics doesn't mean that person is filled with the Spirit. Yes. So if we flip back and look at this, what Paul distinctly says, if you're engaged in sexual immorality, then that means you're not filled with the Spirit. Yes. So that seems to undermine this idea of judging a tree by its fruit with somebody's experience, if they're in disobedience, that's a bad root which results in bad fruit. I'm not gonna rap, which means the tree itself. Is sorry, that a song? Root and root. Okay. Oh, okay. okay so <laughs> I lost, sorry. Do you, do you see the point? Wow. Yes, I just think you're kind of presupposing something that is a matter of disagreement, which is I don't think that being in a same-sex relationship in and of itself represents disobedience. You do, mm. and so that's how, why you interpret it that way, but I don't. And so I think you're asking me to kind of follow a logic at a point where I can no longer follow it. And so that's why I think we actually, we, eventually we have to come back to talk more just specifically about same-sex relationships and the biblical text. Okay, so we yeah. can go... So Vines is wrong about his view of same-sex relationships and, how, and what the Bible teaches, but in terms of being a debate opponent on stage, he's managing himself and the conversation well. If his interpretation of scripture was true, it's not, um, this is how you would frame the disagreement. This is how you would manage the pushback from McDowell, what Vines is doing right now. I'm pointing this out to show that both opponents have skills. I don't know if they're evenly matched, but both, um, they're both, they're, uh, they're, 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 bringing, they're bringing their chops. Back and we can talk about that, we can bring it in. But the question, you would at least have to concede that the Bible doesn't teach. You evaluate something by its experience in somebody's life. It's repentance or non-repentance. Because it seems like we've taken a road and what we disagree over is whether or not sexual immorality includes monogamous same-sex relationships. Okay, we have to establish that that's not what's in mm -hmm. view, okay? But to get there, you've kind of agreed with me that Matthew actually is teaching that Disobedience is bad fruit, right? Oh, you, just, you just don't think... Disobedience certainly is bad fruit. We just have a different opinion about what constitutes disobedience with this topic. Okay, then. Then you need to get rid of this example in your book because you just conceded my point. I, you can see the point that... I'm not fruit, tracking with you. Okay, look. If the point in your book that you use, example number one, is that bad fruit is leading distinctly to unrepentance, Okay, it's not somebody's experience read back into the text. Bad fruit is what leads to unrepentance and disobedience. Correct, are you with me? Are you with me? The bad fruit is what leads to disobedience. Because you just said sexual morality is not disobedience. I mean, I, I certainly agree with you about disobedience being bad fruit. I just think you have an overly narrow frame for saying that's all that bad fruit can mean. And, and I does, think where sometimes does the text say that. I would get, go back again to Galatians. I think that's the clearest explication of the totality of what good fruit is for Christians and how we can know what good fruit is. Okay, so let's move on to your next. Okay, your yeah, next I just think we, yeah, I don't, yeah. Yeah, the reason why this is happening is because Jesus does not explicitly say what bad fruit is. He he. He keeps to the metaphor, but he doesn't explicitly say, this is the referent to the metaphor. But if you are a good Bible reader, you realize he does explain it. it it's in the immediate context. Uh, it, it's in the Old Testament backdrop to his words. The fruit is the teaching that does not align with God's word. We can, I think we're beating this one to death. No, I would be, I would be interested in reading more but, about what you're coming from. I'm not sure I completely understand your okay, critique. Let me sum up but, and then you come back okay. to exactly what sexual morality is, okay? So your teaching is 
what you've said distinctly is that we judge a tree by its fruit, the experience in somebody's life of living out teaching. Correct. Is that right? That's one way. I would say that's important, but, okay. but I would qualify that and say it's not just how someone feels, because our feelings are too subjective, but it's but specifically what the Bible itself calls the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, Jesus isn't speaking about the fruit of the Spirit in this passage. Mm. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying bearing good fruit of repentance. Well, he doesn't so say you're reading that in specifically. You're reading that in. He doesn't say it anywhere. So you're reading it in as well. If he I'm doesn't not, specifically I'm not reading say it in. Repentance. I'm saying he's speaking about repentance. Clearly, lawlessness and obedience is what Jesus is saying. None of those are words that he's using in this text, though. Look at the verse right after it. 23, he says lawlessness <clears throat> is exactly what he says. Uses That's the word not the text I'm talking about. It's in the context. You can't just isolate a text out of its broader context. You have to look at exactly what Jesus is teaching. Amen. I don't know. I honestly do think that you are, ironically, reading a little bit into this text to say, because in other texts of Jesus, or John the Baptist, you know, he's talking about lawlessness or disobedience, therefore that is all that good fruit can be. I don't, I don't see that specifically in verses 15 to 20. So if I'm guilty of reading other verses into it, I'm reading Matthew 7, the verses below, Matthew 3, and the Gospels. You're going to Galatians and bringing something in that That's it. is bookended by contrasting the flesh with the spirit and distinctly says, do not engage in sexual morality. So I'm not the one who's bringing it in, I'm reading it in its context. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Now you push back a question a minute ago, let's talk about that. Okay. You're gonna push back and say, go yeah, ahead, do, you ask Do you it. acknowledge, I'm, I'm going, do you agree with me or do you acknowledge that the specific topic of same-sex marriage is not something that is ever addressed in the Bible? No. I don't acknowledge that. Where is same-sex marriage, you know, where is there a single text that is specifically talking explicitly about same-sex marriage? Okay, so if the standard is explicitly mentioning same-sex marriage, yes. then I would agree with you. But even the Trinity isn't explicitly mentioned. It's based on the teachings of Scripture. That's a doctrine we adopt because it best explains what we know about the character of God. So of course he didn't mention same-sex marriage. There was no debate about this 500 years before the time of Jesus or 500 years after. The unanimous view was that any kind of same-sex relationships were wrong. Mm -hmm. right? So of course it wasn't explicitly addressed, but the teachings of Jesus, Matthew 19, Genesis 1, sufficiently address it. Right, so what I argue, and I talked about this a little bit up there, is that I think that our, the understanding today of same-sex orientation as a, an exclusive, permanent sexual orientation is a new understanding akin to the way that the telescope changed our understanding of the solar system. I think it's a significantly new understanding because it affects how we understand the impact of a rejection of all same-sex relationships. Do you acknowledge or agree that the understanding of gay orientation is not something that was understood or talked about in the church until the mid-20th century? Um, William Loder? I would... I would absolutely acknowledge that the idea of sexual orientation is not taught in the Bible. You want to know why? Because sexual orientation was an invention by Sigmund Freud and his colleagues only a couple of hundred years ago. Before that, nobody talked about sexual behavior this way. It was always understood that sexual activity and sexual desires belong in the category of what human beings do. It does not belong in the category of who human beings are. So, of course, the Bible doesn't talk this way. Nobody did. Uh, up until, uh, in, the, in the grand scheme of humanity, five minutes ago, relatively. A affirming New Testament scholar would disagree with you, who's written a thousand pages on this in multiple books. In his book, The New Testament on Sexuality, says there was a basic sense of sexual orientation in that culture. Bernadette Bruton. That's actually wrote, not she quite talked what he about says. That. I have the quote actually right here if you want me to pull it out. He says there's a basic sense of sexual orientation. Now he says it's not perfectly he says analogous, it's not the same. but he says it's sufficient to be the same. But here's my question. I don't see why it matters. Now don't hear me saying, if I don't see why it matters, that I don't care about gay or lesbian people. 
if anybody hears me saying that, they're completely mishearing my point. That's not fair. Right. My whole point is Genesis 1 through Leviticus, through Romans 1, through 1 Corinthians 6, Matthew 19, a consistent pushback to this creation narrative that God has made male and female and has designed them to be in a monogamous, one flesh union for life. And the Bible never affirms a relationship outside of that. So you even said in your book, you said it right here, that if it's rooted in creation, then the idea of orientation or new scientific advances wouldn't change this if it's rooted in creation. Now you disagree and say it's not rooted in creation. That's where I say that it is. So sexual orientation doesn't change the biblical teaching about God's design for men and women in the relationships of marriage. Right, well here's why I think it, it matters. Because I think in your reading of Matthew 19, you kind of see an implicit rejection of same-sex marriage, right? So notice what Vines is doing. Have you, uh, I'm catching on here. So by the way, not familiar very much with Vines. I know of his reputation. Uh, I know of his, the, the book or books that he's written. Uh, and, and he came to the fore, this d debate or discussion, whatever you want to call it, is five years old. So he came to the fore um, a while ago. But I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I, I've never seen him speak before this. Um, I'm not too, too familiar with him. So it's, it's dawning on me what he's doing. What he's doing is, in terms of having a discussion, is he's not engaging the text. Have you noticed that? He's not engaging the Bible. He's critiquing McDowell's engagement of the text, which is, it's clever. <laughs> but um, I would argue not sufficient uh, if you are an opponent on the stage in real time having a discussion like this. You need to engage the text, right? McDowell is bringing up verses. He's providing his own exegesis for the text. He's challenging Vines to say, hey, you know, what's wrong with my exegetical interpretation? Vines is just critiquing McDowell, but he's not, he's not bringing arguments. He's not bringing his own exegesis to the table for a discussion, and you absolutely need that. So. I see an affirmation that God has designed marriage between one man and one woman in a committed relationship for life. And Jesus went out of his way to say that it's male and female. It quotes Genesis 1.27. He didn't have to. That marriage is a gendered institution. He points back to creation. Right, so you see that as an implicit rejection of same-sex marriage. It's an implicit rejection of any kind of sexual relationship outside of that one flesh union. Right, so the reason that I think it's important to, under to acknowledge or understand that what we're talking about does differ significantly from what the church had been talking about prior to very recent generations is because I think ultimately it's anachronistic to say, what does the Bible say about same-sex marriage? Well, we'll go back to Matthew 19, and because Jesus says God created the male and female, therefore he's kind of implicitly <coughs> saying no to gay marriage. I think that's asking, I think that's trying to import a context that is alien to that text. And yes, I would agree with you, it is true. Marriage in the Bible is only ever talked about as heterosexual. In the New Testament, it becomes exclusively monogamous. The question that I raise is, we're talking about something that the Bible did not explicitly discuss, and so I think we have to look to the deeper principles of Scripture's teachings on marriage and sexuality to ask whether there can be space, faithful space, for committed, monogamous, covenantal, same-sex relationships in, that is consistent with the core principles of Scripture's teachings on marriage and sexuality or not. And the alternative... So I agree with Vines here. Let's focus on the fundamental principles taught in Scripture of sexuality and marriage. And let's extrapolate from those principles to our current 21st century situation where same-sex attracted people are getting married in monogamous relationships, okay? But even if you do that, and I get that emotions are all wrapped up in this, and this is a very difficult thing for a lot of folks to hear, LGBT, um, you know, pro-LGBT folks, Andy Stanley apparently— but even when you do what Vines proposes, you cannot justify same-sex marriages, guys. 
Why is that? Because marriage is designed to accomplish a couple of important functions. And we see this in both the Old and New Testaments, right? Uh, to multiply. In other words, to produce the next generation. That's, that's Genesis uh, 128. Let's take a look at Genesis 128 here. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Uh, it, it, it's also supposed to reflect Christ's relationship to the church. That, that's, that's in a lot of places in the New Testament. You know, Ephesians 5, it, let's go there. Ephesians 5, let's become very familiar with these passages, ladies and gentlemen, because this is important in this kind of discussion. Ephesians 5, um, verse 31, look, what is Paul doing here? He's quoting Genesis. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now watch this. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So Paul quotes Genesis 2 and then says, oh man, this mystery is about Christ and the church. That's what, uh, that's what marriage reflects. The same thing is taught in 2 Corinthians 11. You can also look at the picture of the, the lamb's bride at the end of Revelation. Same-sex couples shrink down God's greater design, God's greater purpose. They, they, it, they reduce down the bigger picture of marriage, which is a joining together of both representatives of humanity to affect the entire human race. And I think the reason why many are taken with same-sex marriage is because they're just not thinking bigger picture. Obviously, one couple on a, on a micro scale has children in their own single family. But when all people follow that design set by God, given as a commandment in the beginning by God, then humanity itself is affected on the macro scale. That was the design for human beings given by God explicitly in Genesis 1. Now, I know this makes a lot of folks upset to hear this, but before we have feelings about whether or not something is true, we all need to first understand what is true. You can reject the Bible, but you can't say that it affirms same-sex coupling. So, uh, Vines has a lot of work ahead of him if he's going to claim otherwise. Alternative, if there is not, as I mentioned, is that we would need to modify the historic Christian doctrine on celibacy which has understood celibacy as a spiritual vocation and a gift and not to be mandated on a whole class of people simply on account of who they are. If, if there can be no faithful space for same-sex marriage within the church, then we have to revisit the doctrine of celibacy and we would have to modify that historic Christian teaching because either way, okay. we are dealing with new information about same-sex orientation and we have to respond to that. We are, are we? We, I see a, we're kind of at a fork in the road and we can respond to it in one of two ways either through modifying the Christian teaching on celibacy, and I can talk about why I don't think that that is the right way to go, or by modifying the historic Christian doctrine on marriage so that it could be inclusive of two men or two women, which I recognize as a significant shift, and so I understand how that can uh, produce okay. some anxiety so, for people. But I think that's why it matters that what we're talking about is not something that was specifically addressed in Scripture, because yes, we need all of our beliefs to be grounded in Scripture, but if we have a topic that was not specifically addressed in Scripture, then we also have to be attentive and be conscientious and looking to what are the core principles here. Okay. And okay, again, Vine says this concept is not taught in Scripture, but there are principles in the Scripture that shape our understanding with regard to sex and marriage. And those principles are that both representatives of humanity come back together in this wonderful inverse relationship to the way that they were originally created, you know, woman comes out of man's side. So, I mean, we haven't even talked about this aspect of it, but the woman comes out of man's side, and yet man and woman come back together, and in that coupling, obey God's command to multiply. So, there is this interesting relationship that marriage has to the creation account itself, and it comes down to this one phrase, one flesh. Man and woman, before woman was created, was one flesh. 
And then in marriage, they come back together to be one flesh. And out of that, new creation emerges, the next generation. This, this is a unique activity that only men and women can do together. And this activity speaks theology. It speaks of creation. It takes us back to the garden. It speaks about Christ and the church. It accomplishes a number of things for God and his purposes. All right? Uh, by the way, if you're watching right now, this is completely live, okay? Uh, would you do me a quick favor and like and subscribe to the channel and share this video? I don't do this a whole lot very well, um, but I need to get better at it. It really does help me get the word out about what I'm up to here at Wise Disciple. I really appreciate all of you uh, who have already done that. Let's get back to the video. Would this path or this path be most consonant with those core so, principles? So let me ask you this. Your whole argument is that the biblical writers were not aware of sexual orientation and the kind of same-sex relationships we have today. 20 minutes. Okay, I'd say that's a part of the argument. That's, that we just talked about, okay. fair enough. So if God wanted to communicate transcendent, cross-cultural guidelines and norms for sexual relationships, given that they weren't aware of it, how could God have done this? Because it seems like you're saying, Tails I win, heads you lose. The biblical writers were not aware of it. They couldn't have addressed it. And since they didn't address it, therefore we have to consider that it's okay. No, so that's, how, not what I, that's not how, what I'm saying. Though. So how could, if God wanted to communicate, and by the way, your argument kind of assumes that the scriptures are not inspired and God couldn't foresee this. No, no, I disagree Because if that. he's God, of course mm -hmm. he could foresee it. So distinctly, my question is, how could God have done a better job of communicating his design for marriage and sexuality, assuming they didn't have this information to talk about? I think the information was there, but I'll just grant you that. How could God have done a better job communicating that cross-culturally? Well, I think that's a bit of a tendentious framing of the question. Uh, but, so there are, there are a couple points that I want to respond to. That's a big to. SAT word, by the way. Oh, I'd, I'd like you. a definition there too, actually. Tendentious, man. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> now I, I, I got a little lost after the second point, but... Do you want me to rephrase it? No, because you, you made two points that you were responding to. Oh, okay, here's the point, first thing. No, my argument is not because the biblical authors don't discuss it, therefore it's fine. That's not a particularly good argument, because there are plenty of things that, you know, what, what do you want sure. to... Internet pornography, right? That's obviously not discussed in the Bible, because the internet didn't exist. Um, but... That's why there are so many topics that aren't discussed in the Bible, and we look to the, to the biblical teachings that are as relevant as possible. We look to core principles that we can find from Scripture. And because Jesus says that we should not lust, you know, that tells us a lot about that topic of internet pornography. But, so it's not just that the Bible doesn't talk about same-sex marriage. It's that I think that the core principles of the biblical teaching on marriage as we find in Jesus is teaching in Matthew 19. Yes, of course the framing is heterosexual because same-sex marriage was not even on the radar screen of possibilities here. The conversation around gay people, gay Christians. That was so what McDowell is not doing at the moment, which I wish he would, is asking Vines a very important question. Okay, you say that the principles for same-sex marriage are in the scripture. Okay, let's walk through those biblical passages together. So you can exegete those texts for us and identify those principles. Now, where should we turn to first, right? Then you force your opponent to either come up with some biblical passages or not. Notice again, Vines, he just wants to stay in the abstract. He just wants to talk big picture about, and conceptually about the Bible and concepts in the Bible, but he doesn't want to go to any passage of the scripture, at least that's what it seems to me, uh, and really spend time dealing with what it actually says, dealing with dealing with it in its context and trying to exegete what it actually means. Uh, he, he simply alludes to these principles, you know, but he's not actually identifying, uh, you know, any of the passages where these principles actually derive, and that's just not good enough in a discussion like this. It's not even within the bloodstream of the conversation. But the core principle that he's getting at, he's talking about how marriage is fundamentally about covenantal faithfulness. Okay, Jesus does not say that in Matthew 19. 
Well, I think he, he does ta- not say it's about fundamental <laughs> covenant. That's a part of it. He says it's about male and female. That's exactly what Jesus says. You can't skip over that and say it's about covenant. Now, I'm with you 100% that it's about covenant. So it's more than a gendered institution, but it's no less. Jesus points back to creation. And you said in your book, if God, if the text is teaching that God created us to operate in a certain way, male and female, then it is cross-cultural. And that's exactly what the scriptures did. So as far as scripturally, it's irrelevant, the topic of sexual orientation, which is highly debated on all sides of this issue. That topic can be debated, and we obviously won't go there right now. That'll take us aside. But my question is, how could Jesus have done this better? I'm not sure you've answered that. If he wanted to communicate cross-culturally, what's better than pointing back to the beginning, this is how I made it to operate, it's still injunction today. Therefore, it yeah. transcends cultural changes. Do you think... Even- so how could Jesus do it better? Good question. It's a good question. A better one. Go to any... Where can we go anywhere in the Bible that, that supports what you're saying? You know what I mean? That's, if James White were up there right now, he's the first one that comes to mind because he does this all the time. That's exactly what he would be doing. <laughs> you know, And the reason why he continues to do this in debates, right? James White now is, what, he's on his nine millionth debate, right? But he continues to do the same thing. Why? Because it's effective. Because that really does work. Even more than like lusting would with internet pornography. Do you think the church has ever misinterpreted a teaching of Jesus? Of course. So in theory then, you could say the same thing and say, well, if the church broadly misinterpreted a teaching, then you could say, well, Jesus could have said it better. But I would never say that because that's just not, that does not feel, um, I would more put the onus on the church for, well, we got it wrong, we are human, we okay, have human the, the, failings. The mere fact that the church has made mistakes in the past doesn't mean we're missing it on this issue. Right, but we were that trying to follow. suggest Good. that if, the basically, because the church has long held this based on how they interpreted scripture, in theory, scripture could have been written in a different way that... Uh, in order to be more affirming of same-sex marriage, and therefore my position rests on a lack of inspiration no, I'm, of the I'm Bible. No, I'm not making a tradition argument. I'm not making a tradition argument. Well, then, I'm saying explain... let's look at Matthew 19. Right, but can you explain can again I... why you think that my argument rests on a lack of inspiration of the Bible? No, that point was simply, y- you were saying they weren't aware of sexual orientation at that time. But I'm saying if God wants to communicate something cross-culturally, he knew that this was coming in the future, and could know that and address it, and isn't bound by some scientific finding of the day. That is true, but if that's how God wanted to work, then the church would never have gotten anything significant wrong. Because in theory, take an issue like slavery. It is understandable. It is awful, but it is understandable how pro-slavery Christians interpreted the Bible to support their position in defense of slavery. In theory, you could say, well, you know, Jesus never outright condemns slavery. He talks about slaves in some parables, he never outright condemns it. Now, I think everyone in this room would agree about what Jesus' position on slavery would be. This is not a contentious issue today, fortunately. But if you go back 200 years, 150 years, it, oh, that's right. Uh, if you go back 150 years, though, it's an incredibly controversial issue. And you could make the very same argument. A pro-slavery Christian could say, well, if Jesus was really against slavery, why didn't he condemn it? He had the chance. So I can't, it's, you know, it's not up to me. I don't know exactly how God always intends to operate. That's beyond my pay grade. But... (laughs) It's ironic that Vines brings up slavery when the principles of anti-slavery are in the Bible. (laughs) It's the same thing, man. It's, 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 uh, the principles of, like, how did the abolitionists actually argue anyway? Where did they go for their justification to oppose slavery in the first place? It was the Bible. I mean, hello, the principles of anti-slavery were in the scripture. It's the the same thing as this discussion right now. But I do know that this has happened before and that the church has gotten things wrong broadly. The church has gotten teachings of Jesus wrong. And I think— Yeah, but how would we know that we were wrong in the past about a teaching of Jesus? How could someone show us— that we were wrong by going to the scripture and making an argument, right? 
And by the way, Vine's not doing that. So far in this discussion, he's pointing out that the church has been wrong before, but not proving it in this particular instance. We have to be open to that possibility without saying, okay, therefore, I'm open to it. without saying, therefore, the Bible is not inspired. That, so that's not my argument. That's not my argument. If you read the 2003 book, Princeton University Press by Rodney Stark, the definitive work on slavery, he says it didn't start in the 19th century anti-slavery movement. Back in the early church, people were resisting and making arguments against slavery. It goes back to Aquinas and earlier in the Middle Ages. Although Aquinas was actually pro-slavery, but just with certain conditions. No, Rodney, Rodney Stark, I think, is right about this, about Aquinas critiquing it. His whole point is... He critiqued is, forms of slavery, but he did not condemn slavery categorically. In fact, there was no he Catholic made pope... He critiques distinctly of slavery. But of it, forms of it. it listen, was, there was no the Catholic point is, what Stark argues, is that there's been a consistent voice, theologically based, condemning slavery. It's just that people didn't listen to him. That's totally different. I agree that some people were wrong and manipulated the scriptures to justify how they wanted to enslave people. But not of even intentionally manipulated. I think some people sincerely believed Whether it. Whether they believed it or not, they were mistaken. We can talk about when people were right or wrong about slavery and other issues. Fine, I can see people can be wrong about that. But here we're talking about Matthew 19. Jesus points back to the creation. He affirms God made them male and female. He affirms the Genesis account that one man and one woman in a committed relationship for life is normative. So the possibility that we've been wrong on other issues has nothing to do with us being wrong on this one. You've it's got good. to show me distinctly in the text why I'm wrong and why I think Jesus' view is wrong. That's right. That's the question. Where in Matthew 19 am I missing it? Okay, I think the difference is I read his statement at the beginning of Matthew about God made the male and female as part of the framing and how he is framing his response. It's a non-answer. He's not answering the question. Um, by the way, I would love to see Vines ask McDowell more questions. I think McDowell is largely controlling this period of questioning. You know, just from a debate perspective, I think Vines should be asking more questions. But still, I mean, McDowell... He's, he's asked Vines repeatedly over and over and over again. Let's go to the text. Let's go to the text. And Vines won't do it. Response of question. At the end, you know, so G the, Jesus, and there are varying interpretations on this, but I think in general, many people interpret it to say that Jesus makes at least one exception for divorce in the case of infidelity. But he does not make an exception in the case of infertility, which is actually really interesting and countercultural in his context in which many people would have seen if a woman, and of course they always sort of blame the woman even if it wasn't, um, if, if that wasn't fair, that if the woman was unable to get pregnant, then of course the man should be able to discard her and try again because it's all about having heirs, that sort of thing, and that's not Jesus' view of marriage. So that's why I was saying I think Jesus elevates the covenantal commitment foundation of marriage above, for instance, the ability to procreate. So that was, that was my initial Ten minutes. point. Um, okay, so he never discounts the creation ordinance from Genesis 1. I agree with you that in the Old Testament, the building of God's people was through procreation. You write this in your book. Right. Gets to the New Testament, now the family of God is understood differently. Right. But Jesus still keeps marriage as an institution, even in the church age, which is why I quoted Luke 20, 33 through 34, when he says, when we die, we won't no longer need marriage because we'll live forever, we won't need to procreate. So the institution of marriage is gone. So you're totally right that he is elevating covenant, but he's not getting rid of the creation mandate, which includes procreation as a heart of marriage, which assumes there would be male and female. So where in the text am I missing that? I think you're... I mean, I, I largely agree with what you're saying in that, yes, Jesus is hearkening back to Genesis 1 and 2. Jesus is talking about marriage as, you know, in a heterosexual framework because certainly in his context, there is no other framework to even talk about it within. But we're asking How do you know that's what motivated Jesus? How do you know that's what motivated Jesus mm. and why he talked about sex in that manner? because that's not what he says. He talks about it because that's how Genesis describes it. You're assuming that he's importing something from his culture when Jesus is pointing back to Genesis. So how do you know? 
that's what was motivating Jesus to just describe it because that was the only framework that they had. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? It's a good question. Well, likewise, I would think that you're assuming that he is making some particular point about exactly how not answering the question gender complementarity between male and female functions in a way that then has a direct word to speak against same-sex marriage and i think that there's a bit of a leap of logic in that and okay, that's so let's, why I let's think, talk about that why am i wrong yeah. about the complementarity that jesus is assuming vines decided uh at least in this discussion portion i'm just going to critique mcdowell guys I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not really gonna try to support myself all that much. I'm specifically not really gonna go to the text of scripture and try to exegete it at all. I'm just gonna critique McDowell. And even when McDowell asks me a question like, "How do you know something?" I'll just flip it around and critique him. And and <laughs> that's how I'll get through this discussion segment. Based on Genesis, tell me why I'm wrong, scripturally speaking, that Jesus doesn't assume complementarity. Yeah, I think I meant something a little bit different by that. What I mean is that people will often argue that <laughs> men and women are complementary in a unique way that means that marriage can only be between men and women. And so I like to unpack that statement to ask what people exactly are getting at when they're talking about the complementarity of male and female. Yes, of course, male and female complement each other, but do they complement each other in a way that can be shown biblically to be universally and exclusively normative for marriage relationships. Let's and so talk we, about it. we could talk about you know, the role yeah. of procreation in okay. marriage. So some people will argue that because marriage must be procreative, or it must be biologically procreative, and, or at least have the possibility of that, and therefore same-sex marriage cannot fit within a Christian vision of marriage. Whereas I would look at that and say, even in the Old Testament, when procreation was of paramount importance to how God was building his kingdom people, you have marriages that are infertile, like between Hannah and Elkanah, or between Abraham and Sarah, that sure. are not regarded as invalid on that basis. And then when you look to the New Testament, can we talk about that and then sure. go to the New Testament? So it's not actually having the kids that makes the marriage valid. It's the kind mm -hmm. of union, the one flesh union, that takes a man and a woman, that by its nature is oriented towards procreation. So right. they're infertile. But see, that's an assumption. Infertile. It's, not an, it's not an assumption. It is an assumption. It's, it's taught in the text. Infertility is the lack of something that is supposed to be there. So a chair's not infertile because it's not the kind of thing that can reproduce. A man and woman in a marriage are infertile because something's broken and not operating the way that it is supposed to. But mm -hmm. if a man and woman come together, as it says in Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2, have this permanent leave the father and mother, cling to the spouse, and then create their own household, which is oriented towards having kids. You see that pattern there. Even <clears throat> if the kids don't result, it's the kind of union that makes it a one flesh union. So it's not actually the kid that makes it a valid marriage. So I agree with you about Elkanah and the other example, but that doesn't undermine the one flesh union as being necessary for marriage. That's what Genesis teaches in the first two chapters yes, of the Bible. I think marriage and what's missing from this conversation is how God intervenes miraculously to provide the children they desire. Sarah was the other example. You know, Abraham and Sarah are incredibly old. They could not produce children, and yet they were given a promise by God that they would have offspring. And God gives them Isaac, right? The child of promise. But what are we to conclude from this if we adopt Vine's point of view, that Abraham and Sarah did not have a valid marriage because they couldn't produce children? Or that they did have a valid marriage even though they couldn't have children because of the covenant? That's not what the Genesis account is teaching at all. It's teaching a completely different lesson about God's promises tied through a promised child. As a matter of fact, producing children is tied to God's redemptive plan for all of humanity. You can take a look at Genesis chapter 3, right? It is through Eve's offspring that the one will come to crush the head of the serpent. So, producing the next generation plays a vital role in the coming of Christ. And again, now on the other side of the resurrection, marriage reflects Christ's relationship to the church. The bottom line is, infertility is not a feature of the design. 
So just because some married couples can't produce children doesn't change God's design. Vines, he's just going to have to find another way to make his argument. Marriage does involve a one flesh union in a unique way as compared to other relationships. My question, once again, and this is why I do think it's very important for biblical interpretation that we recognize that we're talking about something that is not specifically discussed in scripture and that has not explicitly been discussed and debated in the church until recent decades. Because the question that we have to ask then is not, is a one flesh, Bible, is a one flesh union always talked about in the Bible in heterosexual terms? Yes, it is. Five minutes. The question is, is what is going on at the core of what makes a one flesh union one flesh union? Is that something that could be lived out in a same-sex relationship. And so if what is at the core of a same-sex... Okay, that's a great question. Now, how do we answer it? We need to go to the scripture for this. And I still have not seen Vine use scripture to specifically answer this question. He's danced around the issue a number of times, but not provided a scriptural basis for the argument that he wants to make. ...of a one flesh union is the capacity for biological procreation than it would not be. But what I see, and you talked about this a little bit with a reference to Laban and the way in which flesh, being a, flesh and bone are talked about as a kinship bond. Obviously, marriage is kinship plus. <laughs> it's, not, you know, it's not just the same as being an uncle, but there's something there in terms of Adam and Eve, through forming a one-flesh bond, are creating a new primary kinship bond that is also sexual, that involves the total giving of oneself, of one's life, of, in the modern day, of one's finances, also of one's physical self, of one's sure. body. And so the one flesh union is a sexual union, but I don't see where in scripture a one flesh union, yes, the question is not, is it always talked about in heterosexual terms? Because it is. But we are talking about something that the Bible does not talk about specifically. So then we have to ask, well, is there anything that is universally and exclusively normative in how the Bible talks about one flesh unions? that makes it so that it could not apply to same-sex couples. And I think it's insufficient to just- Yes. The answer is yes. Here. Take a look at this. Genesis chapter two, verse 18. Or not 18, excuse me. Um, Let's take a look at uh, the Lord creating uh, Eve. Watch this. Um, Adam, verse 20. Adam, for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Okay, stop. The unique creation of woman shows us that what God has intended was for men and women to be together in relationship. It starts with the word helper. Actually, it's back up here in 18. So I, I guess I was right. Helper, you know, the Lord God says, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. There is no helper. So God takes one of the man's ribs and creates a woman with it. Guys, the symbolic imagery is off the charts with that. It's meant to show that men and women were created to be together. They were made for each other. The woman was made out of a man's own body. Even the nature of the, you know, the, the Hebrew words, right, for man and woman, ish and isha, the relationship of men and women together is even seen in the language itself. But then the question is, what is the telos? How are men and women to be in relationship with each other? And the answer is marriage. Look at this, verse 23. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, it's all connected. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The therefore is the culmination of the entire story of the creation of woman. The terminus of the idea of why a woman was created in the unique way that she was created is this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and, is, and he will become one flesh with his wife. This is the definition of, as well as an explanation for, marriage for the human beings that God has created.
Does that mean everybody gets married? No. Does that mean everyone has children? No. But this right here is the design for humankind. And Vines is trying to tell us, well, the Bible doesn't give us any indication that men and women in marriage is normative. Of course it does. And, and what it's going to take is more than denying what the Bible teaches. Vines is actually going to have to explain how Genesis 2, at like probably 18, going all the way down to verse 25, is not normative for all mankind, right? Therefore, a man shall leave his, fa his father and his mother. This is typical for all men. Um, as a matter of fact, I think McDowell should be asking this question, you know, how is this not, can you prove that this is not normative for people? Let's find out what happens. Say, well, it never applies it to same-sex couples because of course it doesn't. We're talking about something the Bible wasn't talking about. So I, I would need to see something going beyond just saying, well, it always, you know, it never actually applies it to them. Well, what's the reason why we could not faithfully make that okay, application? So two questions. You're right, where it says in 224, where it says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, can refer to David and the people of Israel or others. But then in the text, it says, this is in 223, this is at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she's taken out of man. Therefore, there's a transition, and it moves specifically, a man leaves his father and mother, holds fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There it is. Yeah. So there's a difference between being of the same flesh and being one flesh. Now, does this text explicitly describe the anatomical parts? Of course not. And but actually no biblical here's text why. does. Two minutes. It doesn't have to. It's obvious, Matthew. It's obvious. If you read the text, it's clear that a man and a woman line them up together there's a certain fitting that takes place that doesn't with the same gender. I think it's that, not possible. Yeah, I think that that argument. And especially, let me finish. And especially when it's in the context of a mother and a father populating and filling the earth, when the term is connecto, which is his opposite, the text is clear. It's clear. Not to mention Romans one says they exchanged function which krasis in the Greek refers specifically to function that somebody was designed for. It's in the text. Yeah. You have to read something I would just else say, though, I to think, see it. I think that that argument is, I mean, you actually moved away from a biblical argument, and you moved to just saying, just line up a naked man and woman and see how the parts fit. No, that's, that's you, not fair. That's, that's what not you what, said. Uh, no, it's not fair. I just <laughs> walked through one and two, and explain the obvious intuitive nature of what the Bible's teaching. But I didn't import something onto it. But you it. said that it's obvious it. based on anatomy, right? The anatomy is a part of what makes it obvious. Yes, I would agree with that. And I think that that's not something, so you're saying, well, the Bible doesn't ever specifically say that, but it doesn't say it because it's obvious. I think that that is something. Ah, look at the reframing of McDowell's argument right there right, by vines. By the way, this helps you as a debater to constantly lay a framework for the audience. So I've said this many times in previous videos, whoever lays a better framework usually ends up winning the debate, even if they didn't bring substantive arguments <laughs> to the stage. Uh, but the problem is, vines just will not engage with the biblical text. Instead, he just wants to critique McDowell and try to reframe McDowell. And that affords him the opportunity to further his claims. But make no mistake, he's not dealing with the scripture in any substantive way, and he absolutely must when it comes to this kind of discussion. It is Let's wrap more up. likely to seem obvious to someone who is heterosexual. And so I think we just need to be careful about how we make assumptions about what's obvious that correspond much more to some people's experience than to others. I think so obviousness has to do with being human. And sexual orientation has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with the obviousness of male and female and the fittedness within this text to populate and fulfill the earth. Time. It can only be done with a male and female. So I, guess I do have a thought about that, but I know we need... Unfortunately, um, it's yeah. time for parents. All right. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> interesting exercise here, right? As a 
Christian who takes the Bible seriously and has studied it, specifically as a pastor and a Bible teacher, and I was hoping to see a lot more effort from Vines in engaging with what the Bible actually says. There was a lot of critique of McDowell and furthering um, Vine's own claims there, but I just didn't see any real engagement with the Scripture. McDowell, on the other hand, pressed Vine's pretty hard on the Bible and what it teaches. He asked some really great questions. He wouldn't let Vine's go too far too fast, right? He's saying, slow down, slow down, right? He tried to take it one claim at a time. He brought up Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 19, Genesis 1 and 2, and really made effort to exegete the text to provide true clash. The problem is, Vines would not clash with the Bible, he just tried to clash with McDowell. Because of that, I think McDowell had the upper hand in this exchange basically the entire way through. I do think Vines is a great communicator, and at times, the way that he would frame the discussion was fairly solid, advantageous to his position. But as an interlocutor, you need substance as a foundation for your rhetoric. And I just didn't see any substance from Vines. Uh, well, now it's your turn. You tell me what you think. Uh, who did a better job on that stage, Sean McDowell or Matthew Vines? Uh, let me know in the comments. And I see with the live stream, y'all are having a good time here. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, I appreciate y'all watching this video live with me. Hey, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, please do me a favor and check out two things. First, we have merch. I don't know. <laughs> did you know that? Uh, I usually don't talk about this for some reason, but we have merch. We've got t-shirts, we've got hoodies, we've got coffee mugs and more. Um, all the designs for the store were made by yours truly. So I hope you like them and all the proceeds go to Wise Disciple, the 501c3. So we are a nonprofit ministry. Um, so there is that. I... I should say I'm proud of, you know, some of the designs there, and I think it'll get you having um, some wonderful conversations with people uh, in your circles where you're at. Also, uh, come join the Patreon. We are an up-and-coming community, and I've got some things in the works that are going to be huge, guys. I can't talk about it right now. It's not quite happening yet, but when it does, man, it's going to be amazing, especially in terms of debate. So uh, check out the Patreon in the notes below. The link is there. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm going to take a break um, off to Atlanta for first aid evangelism, but I will return soon with more videos. And in the meantime,